Hello, good evening, everybody, and lovely to have you here. My name is Jackie Schott. I'd like to welcome you to this Holding Space for Self and Others webinar, where we're going to be focusing on working creatively with online counselling. It's lovely to see you all here. Thank you for having your cameras on so we can see you and you can see each other. We're going to be doing some interactive work tonight, so it's really great that we can connect in in these very active ways. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from today, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation, and pay our collective respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to especially welcome our Indigenous brothers, sisters and colleagues here tonight. It is lovely to have you all here, so welcome. The, I know many of you are working online as well as potentially face to face. And I know particularly those in Victoria at the moment are in a place where they're probably doing even more online work. So I think this is something that some of us have been doing for quite a few years already in different formats. And for some of us, it's incredibly new. So I do hope to be able to share some of my ideas, things that I know have worked for me, and also things that I've been doing training in as well that I know have been successful for others that I'd like to share with you tonight. So, the welcome is something that um, we're moving through and there'll also be an opportunity after the presentation and at different places to connect in with others. There's a relatively large group here and uh, that nice uh, picture you can see at the top of the slide there is one of the previous holding spaces we've done. You might even recognise yourself. I know there's some people here tonight who might well have been shot um, in, that, uh, in that picture just there. So we'll have an opportunity to connect in in small groups. And we'll also have a prize giveaway at the end. So we're going to have a competition and you get to do something and then possibly win a, a, a free workshop with us. If you haven't done much of Zoom before, just to let you know, there is a chat box. You can ask questions as we go through and I'll be looking at those periodically. That's also a good opportunity to, um, to do some interactive work directly into the chat box there. It is a large group, as you can see tonight. So I would really encourage if you could to keep your microphone on mute as it is at the moment and to keep your camera on so you can see others and we can see you as well. This is being recorded, as I've mentioned. If during the breakout spaces you happen to disconnect or if your internet isn't super stable and you do happen to just log out, then feel free to log in again. Adrian will let you into, um, into the space as you've been entered into already. So. So this is just a little bit about uh, me. Uh, a good 10 years ago when I had somewhat less wrinkles. I've been working in this field for about 30 years and mostly do training work these days, but I still do some counselling and supervision as well. I'd also like to acknowledge before I start tonight, some of the other people I've been inspired by and some of the other people who I know are doing great work creatively online. Dr. Monica Moore, Dr. Marlene Mayhu, Ariel Ladd, Landrum, Susan Perrow, Liana Lowenstein, and plenty of others, but these are some people I've made specific reference to in this presentation tonight. The topic tonight is creative engagement for counselling online. And when I was preparing this a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking there are a couple of critical things I do want to mention before I focus on creativity, which is a real passion of mine, as many of you know. I think before we look at the whole issue of creative engagement for counselling online, we have to go back to basics and remember that we need to have engagement for counselling before we do anything else. And then specifically in this time when we might be doing more online work, we need to have the prerequisites to be able to adequately manage engagement for counselling in this space before we can look at the whole picture of creativity, which will certainly be the focus. So let's start with the basics again. What does engagement for counselling actually mean? I know many of you work with children and young people, and many of us also work with people who are mandated to come to counselling. Somebody else has thought it might be a good idea. And whenever we work with children or young people or people who haven't necessarily elected to come to counselling themselves, we have to really work a bit harder at engaging because it might not be people's number one choice to be in a room or in a virtual space with us. So I need to always be asking myself, who is this client? And it might not be the person on the other side of the screen. It might be their parent or their teacher or a carer or another referrer or their partner. What is the primary reason that this person is here with me? What are the expectations from others about this engagement? What efforts have I gone to to make an assessment of what the real needs are in this situation generally? Have I made attempts to be really clear and transparent about what I can deliver and what it is that others expect of me? And when is it that I'm going to review progress in our sessions, regardless of the age of the client that I'm working with? 
I love Petrusca and De Clemente's model of stages of change, which I know many of you will be familiar with. And I think the assumption when people come for counselling, whether they've come themselves or someone else has recommended them, that they're ready for change, that they're at the space of action. But we know many mandated clients are pre-contemplational. They haven't even thought about the fact that change might be necessary or required or recommended by somebody else. So depending on where our client is coming in, whether they're already thinking about changing, contemplational, preparing for it, taking action steps already, already having made change and just want support with that, have maybe made changes and then relapse back into some previous behaviour, or not even thinking about it, the interventions that we offer from a counselling perspective, online or not, are very much dictated by the readiness for change. So I think regardless of what counselling I'm doing, with what age or in what format, I need to be mindful of this as a basic given around engagement. In terms of engagement for counselling on, online, I know many of you are already doing it in many ways, but we need to ensure that we have ourselves and those who we're servicing have access to secure, reliable internet and a secure, reliable platform. And there are some disadvantaged groups that might not have these basic things. So we need to be able to think about how else we can potentially engage, maybe on the telephone, or maybe uh, remote visits or other sorts of ways that we can engage if we don't have these basic things. Do our clients have the capacity to use online devices independently? If we're working with very young clients or very old clients or impaired clients in some sort of way, they might need other assistance. So this is something that we need to negotiate with carers and supporters around to be able to make sure that we can offer the best possible services with the most um, independence and support that's required as possible. And that we're very careful that people have given consent, that we manage privacy and confidentiality in ways that are bigger and broader that we might, then we might need to consider if we're working in an office with a closed door. We, I'm recording this tonight and I've let you know about this, um, but with counselling sessions, obviously I don't record it and I wanna know that others aren't also recording it. With a whole lot of people in homes using um, uh, Alexa and other home Google devices, we have to make sure that they're switched off before we do counselling as well, because they can be inadvertently recording. So we really want to make sure about people's privacy before we do any of this online work. We also might want to do some assessment of how much people have been using online um, platforms in any, uh, in any given day, if we're going to be offering counselling, because we certainly can be quite exhausted with this process. There can also be some disinhibition with working online, which can be advantageous potentially for people sharing things with us, but it can also lower people's normal and healthy guarded resistances to sharing. So we need to sort of balance some of those factors. Practically, we also need to be able to manage safety and crisis. And if you're working with young people or any other clients who might potentially be at risk of harm, then we need to do safety planning and safety checks before we start any counselling. In the handout that I'm going to provide online after this webinar this evening, I'm going to uh, give you a, a couple of pages of a document that includes a telehealth consent form. And one of the things that I like to do if I've made an assessment that a client might be at risk is to know at the start of every single session what their address is, so where they're located at this time. So if need be, I can phone the number that they've given me as their crisis support person or the police should I really need to. If I'm working with young people who are at risk, I might want them to move their device around and show me what's in their room and what's on their bench in front of them so I can make sure that there's nothing that could do them harm. I also want to make sure that they can't lock the door and any parent who is my safety person who might come in can have easy access to their room. So some of those really practical things I think it's worth thinking about before we start any of this sort of work to make sure that our clients are safe, we've done the most ethical groundwork before we start this, this work. Some of the contraindications for online counselling are that clients don't have privacy. Um, there's a, a link to a podcast that I'll give you about working uh, online, which I think is a contemporary one and really practical. And one of the things that Ariel suggests is that if we're working with people who might only, you might be working with someone in a family and they only have a studio apartment and there's three or four people living there. So they might perhaps be having a headset on so no one else can hear you. 
and they might be typing their responses. So that's one way of guaranteeing privacy. No one else can see or hear what's happening. You might have a secret code word that you have if you work with people and if someone inadvertently comes into the room or comes into the house, that they say that word and you realise it's not safe to talk about anything personal, you change a subject no one else needs to know. And then when you say that code word again, it's again safe. So there's ways that you can guarantee that in practical ways with some of the people you might be working with. Very practically, if there's no, not sufficient bandwidth, you can't do this sort of work. And if there's serious safety issues, I wouldn't put the client or myself at risk in doing this remote work. So there's some very practical things to, uh, to guard against. A telehealth check I really like that Robert Grant and Dr. Marlene May came up with was, can you see me and hear me? And I can see, or and I can and can't see and hear you. So we might check initially that we've just got the systems working. Then we want to make sure that uh, the person knows where I'm operating from. So I'm here today in my home office and no one else is here around me or can hear me. Where are you and is anyone else there? Can anyone see or hear your session? And if so, can you acknowledge that you're okay with that? So we might get a verbal um, or a, 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 a non-verbal signal that that is okay. So some practical things to start with. But what I really wanted to focus on primarily tonight was creative engagement for counselling online. Whether we're working with children, young people, adults, if we're working individually, if we're working with parents and children, or if we're working in small or larger groups, there's a range of ways that we can be creatively and engagingly uh, welcoming to the people who are in our counselling spaces. And these are five areas that I'd like to consider with you tonight. Art, nature, music, games and stories. We're going to have an experience with each of these different methods and um, I've given you some prompts of things that to bring in tonight and to have thought about so you're a bit warmed up hopefully to do some of these with me. Regardless of what sort of therapy activities that we're doing for creative engagement, they obviously need to be friendly and able to do in an online format. It, they need to be obviously engaging for the clients that we're working with, requiring minimal or easy to get materials, match to the client's treatment needs. So we're not just doing them because they're fun, but there's some point of relevance to what it is we're working on with this person or with this group. It's appropriate for the stage of therapy. So what we might do initially might not be necessarily the same as what we might do as we progress through or what we might be wanting to do as a finishing exercise. Obviously also it needs to be suitable for the client's stage of development, their attention span and their skill level. So these are some thoughts that Liana Lowenstein has recommended that we think about in some of her presentations that she does. And I know one of the things that she does if she works with children with ADHD is encourage their parents to set the space up for them so that the child stands at least an arm length and a half away from the monitor so they're not tempted to touch or move things around. And they put a little uh, mat or a special towel that the child stands on for that duration. So they get them to move around, but standing away from the monitor. So some of those practical things can be helpful in getting going. So let's start with thinking about some art methods. And I'm going to encourage you to do some stuff in here too. So these, um, in the handout that's available after here, you'll have a whole lot of detailed other links to sites you can go to and resources that you can use for art therapy methods or even just art methods themselves for engaging online. One of the things I'm going to share with you in a moment is the Zoom whiteboard and show you how you can use that in different ways. We can obviously use different virtual backgrounds and I know some people like doing these to select specific thematic backgrounds for clients that they work with and encourage children or young people that they work with to do this also. I find virtual backgrounds personally not ideal for working in a training way or for working with groups or when I'm working with adults. I think unless you've got a green screen, what happens is when you move around, there's a bit of lag and it looks a bit disingenuine. And I think one of the things that's more important to do than ever is to be able to decrease the distance between people. And I think the more authentic I can be and the less virtual tools and toys that I have, the more real that the relationship's gonna be. But definitely for children and young people, super engaging and fun. Again, for young people using memes or GIFs to capture their mood or their emotions to reflect their day or week, doing scribble drawings and story creation, either on a piece of paper or on a virtual whiteboard, time capsule creation, things like drawing my dreams, doing three-part drawings before, now, after, 
write and illustrate your own book, or even do how my body feels can be good. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my whiteboard with you right now. And I'm going to encourage you all to see if you can use it. I know some of you are pretty familiar with Zoom and pretty familiar with Zoom whiteboards, but if you're not, take this as an opportunity to figure out how they work. What I want to invite you to do is to make a mark on this space. And Aidan's gonna unmute and show you how to get in if you don't know how to get in. Uh, yeah, you just go up to the top where it says view options. You click on the little arrow and then you scroll down to annotate. And then when you click on that, you should be, you should see a little box. And you just go and draw and then you can start drawing. Excellent. Here you come. Fantastic. <laughs> all right. Excellent. There we all are. All right. Great. So choose a colour as you're writing here now. We're going to have lots of marks on here very quickly. Choose a colour that says something about how, actually, I'm going to erase that all off and I'm going to clear all the drawings and start again. Pick a colour that says something about how you feel today. Don't have to say anything else. You can use, yep, you can use the stamps to show feeling. You can draw a little shape or a squiggle. Excellent. So what we have emerging here is a group graffiti. So everybody's making a mark here. Who wants to? So everyone has a chance to feel connected and joined in. So this is one way that we can use a board very simply to connect with other people. We can play games on this board. We could do a group scribble and then find shapes and make something of that as we'd like. You can do any of that sort of stuff. Great, there's lots of good things happening here. And as easy as this, I'm gonna clear it again. So I'm gonna clear the board and we're going to do, um, actually what I'll do, I'll stop sharing now. Excellent, it's just getting bigger and bigger and brighter. Beautiful. Okay, I feel a bit sad stopping it actually because it looks so beautiful, but I will stop it there. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is to grab a sheet of blank paper. And I've asked that you have some, a few little drawing materials ready. And what I'm going to invite you to do, I'm going to invite you somewhere on this page to draw a time capsule, whatever that might look like to you. It might be any sort of shape. So just draw a shape as big as you'd like on the page, at least half a page. And then I want you to think about when you've drawn your time capsule, what are three things that you would like to put in this time capsule that would reflect this COVID time for you? What are things that you're particularly aware of or you'd like to remember of this time? They might be particularly positive things. It's quite challenging all around for many of us at the moment, but what are at least three positive things that you've experienced during this COVID time that you would like to, it might be a word that you write in or it might be a representation of a picture. It doesn't have to be, it could be an abstract, it could be a, just a, a splotch, a series of squiggles or colours. What are three things that you'd like to represent about this time? You were to bury this in the backyard and dig it up in 10 years. What would you most want to remember about this time? I'm just going to do that for another minute or so. You certainly don't have to share this with the group, but if you'd like to, I'd be really keen to hear one reflection on this exercise, this time capsule exercise. I think when there are significant life events happening, it's great to be able to capture them in some way. You can certainly write about them, but I think a pictorial representation can be particularly striking. What would that be for you? Would anybody like to share their time capsule? Ah, tell yes. us about your picture. Thank you. Um, this is my picture. Um, it's very childlike. It's me doing lots of horse riding, which I'm loving doing. Um, lots of hearts because I'm 
connecting better with people um, that I don't usually have time to. And there's dollar signs there because I am have never been busier in my entire life with my work. So I guess that sort of created a different opportunity to to spend that on more learning and training and um, resources and materials and equipment. And so there's a lot of abundance actually for me. It's been a, you know, in amongst all the disappointment and the sadness, it's been a really strongly positive time for me in lots of other ways. So um, yeah, so that's what that's all about. Wonderful. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you for sharing that. Fantastic. This is just a small example of how we can use art in different ways. So we can work collectively together on something like a whiteboard, but in fact, we can do many of the art exercises that we might traditionally do with children, with young people or with adults, just by inviting people and giving people an opportunity to share. Just last night, I finished a six week art therapy group online. And that's been incredibly successful for a small group of people who are interested in using art for their own reflectivity and we have at least 45 minutes every week just for art creation, whatever people feel like is right for them to do. So we just sit quietly and people create things. So we're together, but we're separate. So I think there's still enormous opportunities for individual and for group work that we can do in an art capacity and in an art way. Um, could I get you just to give you a bit more confidence if you're not super confident, and I know some of you might not yet be, with the Zoom naming function. If you hover your mouse over where your picture is on the screen, there are three little dots. If you click on those dots, you can drop down to a rename function. Could I get you to rename yourself as your favorite superhero right now? Who's your favourite superhero? This is another fun thing to do for children and young people, but also for adults. Ah, Caroline, like-minded. <laughs> Excellent. What's your superhero? Ah, yes, and Helen too. We're going to have a Wonder Woman club. Oh, and there we go, lots of us. Captain Underpants, oh, very nice. Good. Spider-Man, good. This is a fun thing to do for children. And when I'm doing um, training, and I know some of you have been doing some of the, the courses that we've been doing, when we do role plays, I ask people to change their name into their client's name to do this. So it's when we're managing identities and new identities, we can have lots of fun with this. So I'm going to change my name back. And if you have changed your name, would encourage you to do that too. But um, Children particularly like that function and like being able to be in control in these sort of ways. So just another fun thing to do with uh, that Zoom allows us also. Okay. So let me jump back down here. And share with you some more of these. Music we know can also be used in lots of different ways um, and is incredibly important for counselling and for connection. Particularly, I think, for young people in this age group, there's been some good studies to suggest that four ways at least in which music listening links with wellbeing. Relationship building, modifying emotions, cognitions, and being able to really immerse in a particular emotional state. One of the things that I asked you to prepare and think about tonight was if there was a particular song or piece of music that spoke to you about how you feel right now, where we are in COVID, what would that music be? Could I ask you to type that into the chat box right now? What would a piece of music be that would say something about how you are right now? Obviously, you can read other people's as they come through here. Anna stuck in the middle with you. I feel possessed. Thanks, Emma and Anna. Theme song to The Hobbit. <laughs> Lovely. Just doing it for seasons. It's Beata and Katie. Let it go. Shine on. Bohemian Rhapsody. Green, green grass of home. Fantastic. What lovely songs are you thinking about? So whatever it is, I think 
music, even just the lyrics of music, allow us an opportunity to speak about, to express things that we're feeling that are hard, are tricky, are new, are difficult. There's different ways we can also use music. We can use music uh, in terms of song selection and sharing, like we're doing a little bit now. We can also create music or create songs. We can alter or parody it. Parody it. We can use it for relaxation or enhancing mood. We can also use playlists or assembling songs to be able to communi communicate different things. And there's a couple of different um, parodies that are around at the moment that I think are quite entertaining. And I really wanted to share one of these with you tonight, just very briefly. And the links to this are in the handout that you'll be given as well. Some of you might uh, know the original version of this. This super nasty cataclysmic COVID-19 virus. Even when you think of it, it makes you all perspire us. If they cough at far enough, it's likely to retire us. Super nasty cataclysmic COVID-19 virus. Hope I'm trembling if I'm so high. Missing a crack with it, I'm so high. Waiting for a traffic hit, I'm so high. Wondering what else could come so high. My colleague at such poor hygiene, he never washed his hands. Right off and touched me nose, you see. And I got sick real bad Ooh. for many days. Sick in a ward, I finally went home, and now I'm careful what I touch and, and isolate alone. So it goes on, and if you wanted to see more of that, you can certainly uh, download it. So sometimes we just need a good laugh that can get us over the line, and I think there's a lot less humour around in this new wave than there was initially. Uh, so whatever we can do to boost ours and others' moods, I think is good. I think there's lots of ways that we can also parody existing songs that can give us some feeling of choice and control and volition and expression that young people particularly find particularly engaging. So I'd, uh, I'd charge you to have a look at some of those uh, things that are out there. The other things that uh, we can do with music is, um, is a, a lovely music therapist, Alison Davies, who, again, the link to this is in your handouts, but um, a beautiful song called every little cell in my body is happy and a beautiful just little round that you can sing or play with younger children to feel good too. Nature can be used in many ways for healing and well-being and we can use it to creatively engage in counselling environments as well. Just even practically doing some scavenger hunts can get people outside and Time outside in the sun, even 10 minutes a day, can be really restorative. Using the healing metaphors of nature, encouraging people to make nature mandalas, even painting rocks or making cubby houses outside, safe spaces for self and others to be in, can be really restorative, as well as just growing things and being connected with nature and the elements can be very rejuvenating. Some ideas for scavenger hunts, and there's plenty of them online, something for young children, just in terms of their senses, gathering something hard, soft, something that smells good, something that's a particular colour, and something that maybe makes a particular sound, Going them, getting them to collect those things, bring them back, maybe with assistance, and then maybe even looking at which of those they most relate to, or which of those items is most like what they're experiencing at the moment. So allowing the metaphors of nature to be able to be a way of creatively engaging, starting a counselling process can be useful. And something maybe for older kids or for adults even, something in your room right now that you could look around and maybe find that makes you feel thankful, that reminds you of when you were brave, something that you like to do for fun, that helps you calm down, or an object that represents something not a lot of people might know about you. So again, we can use scavenger hunts that get people up and out and moving, particularly if they've been sitting for a long time, that can be engaging and can also be a good way of starting uh, a therapeutic process. Stories can be used in lots and lots of ways too for therapeutic engagement and again for all ages. Susan Perrow, who's one of the trainers in our training team, um, writes a lot of beautiful therapeutic stories and she wrote this story that she's made available free for uh, people at this time, particularly children, and it's called The Little Gnome Who Had to Stay Home and it's been converted into um, lots of different online formats. There's people reading it, there's puppet shows of it, and she's had a beautiful creative illustrator put a little video clip together. So you can have a look at her site and beautiful stories. You can create stories for the children and young people and adults even that you're working with, or co-create stories. 
these are some books that I really love that I think are particularly good at this time. Um, you can either purchase these books or get them online. I think it, there's a lot of people reading other people's stories and I feel a bit split about that because it takes so much work to create a beautiful book and I think we need to be incredibly careful about copyright. So I think it's fine to read books to your clients individually or in a group if you're running it, but I wouldn't post things online and make them available because I think that is a bit of a copyright infringement. But The Invisible String is a beautiful story about um, a child who's really missing somebody she can't contact and the mother describes the relationship as always connected because there's string that no matter how far apart you are, even when people die, you're still connected to them with this invisible string. Some other lovely books, I mean, there's plenty about um, coping with difficult times, but I also like The Rabbit Listened When Nobody Else Would, The Colour Monster, which is a lovely children's book about, uh, about feelings, and a, a lovely story of resilience, uh, Humpty After the Fall, I'm sure you're all wondering how we really got back up on that wall and this book will tell you all about it. So it's a lovely story for little ones. Some of the books for older kids and for adults that I find really inspiring and it might be particularly good at this particular time, uh, those four, but particularly these two, Man's Search for Meaning, I think is uh, something if you can survive a concentration camp in the Second World War and find meaning and purpose in life, then certainly you can get through COVID-19. I think Viktor Frankl's quintessential book about existential angst and surviving it is really articulated beautifully in that story. And I really like Alain de Botton's Consolations of Philosophy. In every chapter of his book, he looks at a different philosophical approach and a daily life challenge that we all have to manage as adolescents and adults and how that particular philosophy can, if not alleviate the pain, then allow a, a better perspective on things. So I'd also really recommend that book to you. I think the other thing that's really helpful is physically moving. And when we're working with children and young people, it's really great and really a great engagement to start a session with something physical. And any of those practical games can help. Simon Says, doing the hokey pokey, charades, little teapot, rock, paper, scissors, anything that's physically and movement oriented is a really, really great starting place. Other sort of games and activities, I'm going to demonstrate wheel spin to you in a moment, but playing with puppets and allowing them to engage. This is my, he's a really good listener, so you can tell him all your secrets. And he's a bit shy, but he loves talking to big and little kids. So we can have lots of conversations with our puppets as well. Doing bubble blowing, either individually or collectively. Uh, Leanna Lowenstein's lovely cookie breathing exercise. Anything that's physically engaging that can allow, if you haven't done cookie breathing, let's do a quick go of it. Imagine your favorite cookie. Write it in the chat box. What's your favorite cookie? Mine would definitely be Choc Chip. Choc Chip, Marissa as well. Oreo, Sonia, okay, great. Choc Chip, lots of Choc Chip, macadamia nut and white chocolate. Oh, and yum. Okay, so imagine that cookie, whatever it is, and you've put a batch on to bake half an hour ago before you came into the webinar and it's just ready. So when you finish this webinar in half an hour, it's gonna be there for you, but you can't eat it straight away because it's too hot. So you have to very carefully open the oven and take it out. Imagine, you've got your oven gloves on, imagine you're holding that tray in front of you. So hold it in front of you right now, imagine you're actually doing it. And smell those cookies, whatever it is. Can you smell them? Really big, deep, slow breath. So you take it right in and then you have to cool them down before you eat them. Breathe in again and then breathe out. So this cookie breathing, it's a lovely imaginal exercise and it's good for all ages. So a nice practical exercise that you can do to uh, use your imagination, the smell of your favorite cookie and a good practice in deep breathing. What other games and activities have we got? Uh, guess the feeling, we can do that with our faces. So right now, based on the feeling on my face, how might you guess I'm feeling? And now? And now, so we can play these kind of interactive games with our younger clients. Speak Your Mind is a card game that I made up years ago when I was school counselling and I was running family change groups. Let me give you an example of how this works. 
before I do that, just quickly share your room and space. So you might, um, particularly with younger clients, get them to show you where they are and what they like about their space, what's good about it, what's not so good. It's a really great way of engaging and bringing you into their world. Making a safe space in the room, making a safe space maybe for a special friend that you might have who might not feel particularly safe at the moment with COVID. So using the environment around to make a safe space for something else. Let's um, have a quick game of Speak Your Mind. Who'd like to have a game with me? Put your hand up. I'll just pick somebody out, you can unmute. It's really fun. Uh, okay, Gita, thanks. Can you unmute? Yeah. Okay, so this is a random game and I would normally get you to pick a card, but I can get you to pick it because you can choose a number at random. What would you like, one, two, three or four? Three. Three, okay. <gasps> Say something about love. Mm. Love is, can be painful. Love can be painful, great, good. All right, now you can pick a number for me and I'll answer one. Two. Two. Who do you feel closest to in your family? Um, today, I feel closest to my sister, but it changes every day. So we can play these sort of games about any particular topic that you're working on. And because there's a random element to it, it's a bit more fun than it might be otherwise. There's lots of directive, fun, game-based activities that we can do for any client group that we're working with. But I think if we want to make it engaging, the more game-like, the more activity-like it can be, the more successful it can be. I said I was going to show you um, the spin game and I want to demonstrate that to you now. Another activity that you can actually just make up yourself. So I just found this the other, the other day on the web and what it is, it's a web video and I'm going to give you the link to it. And what it allows you to do is put in your own categories of whatever it is that you're working on or whatever it is that you think is useful. and it allows you to spin a wheel and find these things. So, okay, can you all see that? Now I'm gonna press this button and it's going to spin. So I made up this category, child and adolescent counseling online. And all I have to do is click this and it spins around and it lands on, draw it out. Okay, so that's what we're gonna play for the next five minutes. We're going to all draw out how you felt today. Or I can spin it again and get to charades. We're gonna have a game of charades for five minutes. So you can come up with whatever categories you'd like for a game and activity. You can have three things on your wheel, you can have 20 things on your wheel. So you'll get the link to that. And if you work with young clients, that's a fun way of just working out what are we gonna do next? And you don't have to decide because it's just a random pick with that wheel spin. So if you're doing games and activities, an activity like that can be a really good starting place. So the other things that we can use when we're working creatively online are things like therapeutic card sets. And I know I've mentioned this in previous webinars, but I really do love the therapeutic card sets of innovative resources. And many of these are now in an online format as well. So you can use them in different interactive ways with your clients, or you can even make things like activity jars where you just, again, randomly pick out something that you're going to be doing or something that you're going to be doing after this as a, a sustaining exercise. So these are some practical ways that you can uh, use some, uh, some creative game-based, activity-based ways of working. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you um, about five minutes or so now. Aidan's going to put you into groups of two or three people. And what he's going to ask you to do is reflect on any of these different methods for creative engagement, whether it's art, music, nature, games, or story, and how could you use any of those in at least one additional way than you already are with the clients that you work with. So it's going to put you into those groups just for five minutes. So just introduce yourself to somebody new. It might be someone you know. Hopefully you made a new friend tonight. And then when we come back, I'll get a few people to reflect on what it is that they might be able to use of what we have just been sharing here. So Aidan's going to put you into groups now and I'll see you back in five minutes. Good. Anything in your 
groups that you spoke about that you'd like to share with the bigger group about something that might be helpful for the work that you're doing at the moment online? I'm happy to go. Yeah, thank you. Um, for us in my organisation, it's um, I'm new to the role, so I'm new to starting to um, do therapy at the time of COVID as well. So the whole telehealth is brand new and so learning to use any of the tools that I normally would online is, is really good. And we don't use whiteboards, so learning how to do stuff that are not on the whiteboard and don't require you to have the whiteboard facility has been really good. And I hope to start using more of that. Excellent. What platform are you using? Uh, Teams at the moment, and we've just started using the Caribou app. Okay. But if anyone's got any other suggestions, we're open to that. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm using Zoom and I find that quite reliable and I've been using it for quite a few years. If, okay. if you want to type into the chat box what platform you're using and on a scale of one to ten, if one is disastrous and ten is fabulous, what rating you would give it. So what platform you're currently using and what rating you'd give it. And if you're happy to chat about it, we can do that as well very briefly. But there's also to let you know that there's other virtual whiteboards that you can get outside of Zoom if you are using some of those other platforms. So, okay, so there's some good recommendations and thoughts coming in there. Okay, good, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, I appreciate it. Any other thoughts or reflections on what you spoke about in the group just now? Anyone else like to share? I'm happy to share, Jackie. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. <laughs> um, sorry, I had my video because I'm in bed and then I met Marissa and she's in bed too. So, we, you know, we were in the right room, her and I. Um, we, um, I've been in the office all day, so it's <laughs> I need to get out of there. Yeah. Um, I was really interested to hear you say that the in innovative cards are available as an online um, tool. And I'm like so super excited about that because I really miss my cards in this work from home space. So thank you so much. That's what I'll be looking up, yeah. Good, fantastic, great to hear, excellent. Anyone else like to share anything that might've been valuable that they can use from this presentation so far that they've chatted about with their partner in their group? Sure. Yes, thanks, Wanda. Hi, um, I'm Wanda, yes. Um, so I was with Sally in the same room and we discussed play and particularly, um, actually two things that came out really helpful. One is the cookie breathing. We thought this is really nice because it engages kids' imagination and um, senses. Uh, but we also thought with a particular group of children, like those with ADHD, because um, I do see a lot of these kids online. And I find that because of their impatience, and particularly I'm thinking of one particular child at the moment, just very impatient, doesn't want to sit there and, and use her imagination. So we usually use kind of, kind of like hands-on activities so maybe with the breathing I would use like a paper boat that she can put on her tummy and breathe and watch the boat going up and down or we would use a glitter jar so I like the breathing techniques um, but maybe just with the addition of like adding with this particular population but with other kids I think it would be quite helpful. Lovely, uh, great. Yeah. Thanks Wanda, yeah great reflections. It's nice to be able to think about how you could adapt it to your particular client groups as well and to extend on the other good work you're already doing, fantastic. Okay, great. Um, there was a question I noticed here about whether or not those, uh, the card template was available. These ones are, these are just ones that I've made up but I think it, it, it does sort of, there's a whole lot of online resources that you can get and I really recommend the website, the, um, the Facebook site for those of you who are on Facebook, Teleplay Health, oh, sorry, Teleplay Therapy Resources and Support, T E L E, Play Therapy Resources and Support. There's hundreds of ideas for games, for activities, for books, uh, for other training resources. Uh, so that's a really good thing to link in with as well if, you, if you're not already. Um, on that and you're working with children and young people. So just to finish up tonight in the last 10 minutes, what I'd like to do, um, and thank you for connecting in with a couple of other people, is to give you an opportunity now to, uh, to know about our next free webinar, which is going to be in two weeks. Professor Sue Jennings is going to be doing a presentation for us. She's coming in from the UK. 
She's a fantastic presenter and she's written extensively on drama therapy and on play therapy. And she's going to be doing a free presentation on understanding anxiety and insomnia in children and young people and talking about her nesting approach. So if you are able to attend that live, please bring a shawl or a scarf along with you, she's asked, because we're going to be doing something interactive with that. So please feel free to join us in two weeks at this time, 7.30 Sydney time, Wednesday the 5th of August. And you can register for that like you have for this one. I know some of you already attended. It's lovely to see you all. And I hope to see you at another one of these holding space webinars in the coming weeks. So we're doing these every two weeks. And as you know, we've got the previous versions on the site. So um, do feel free to, to take advantage and have a look at any of those. And if you want the PD certificates, just do the quiz and Aidan will follow up with the certificates for you. So thank you all. Have a lovely sleep and sweet dreams tonight, everybody. Bye now.